Thank you. I'd like to welcome our panelists, Stefan Bonsell, CEO of Moderna Therapeutics, Dr. Paul Bittinger, Medical Director of Emergency Preparedness at Massachusetts General Hospital, Dr. David Kaufman, Head of Translational Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Medical Research Institute, and Dr. Rochelle Walensky, Chief of Infectious Disease at Massachusetts General. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time this morning. It seems that when it comes to applying technology, it's all about the right balance, having the right technology at the right place at the right time. So I'd like each of you to give us a sense of where we are with that, just really starting with the clinicians. So Paul and Rochelle, we can start with Paul. Um, what technologies have emerged in your opinion as indispensable to fighting this pandemic? I think it's really important that we have technology to, to share information, uh, especially trying to lead a hospital uh, emergency uh, management program. We have to understand how many patients there are, where they're presenting, what's their critical illness. And we have to be able to share this not just across one hospital or one hospital system, but actually across the, the healthcare network. And so we had some uh, good technologies in place initially with mass notification and, and mass information sharing. But what technologies uh, we've been developing that are much more independent or ones that, that remove the manual effort from a lot of the query to count the patients and count a lot of their, uh, uh, the details about their illness so that we can quickly aggregate data, share data, and, and help people respond better by understanding the complexities of the disease. And Rochelle, as a clinician, what technologies in your view have, have really become important in fighting this pandemic? Um, great, thanks. Uh, you know, there's been a lot that we've been able to do by sharing photos, by sharing EKGs, by, by doing rhythm, rhythm strips if people are concerned that they're on a, on a medicine that might um, change their EKGs or put them at risk of an arrhythmia, they can sort of take those technologies home. We've been able to share photos of COVID toes that you may have heard is in the news. And then on, one of the major technologies I think is really important for public health, and that is we can now attest by our cell phones that we are symptom free. Um, everybody does that when they come to work to our medical institutions, but I'm hopeful that we'll be able to mobilize that as people start returning to work throughout this, the state. And then, um, you know, what I'd really like to be able to do is demedicalize testing so that people could get testing in places other than in medical centers and then receive the results by cell phone. So I think that there's a lot more that we could do, a lot we've mobilized and a lot more we could do. We're going to definitely come back to that on, in terms of how we can um, improve the technologies we have today, but, but uh, before we do that, David, I want to ask you from a research perspective, what technologies are really coming to the fore as useful tools in understanding this virus and this disease? You know, for example, is genetics playing a more important role as we um, encounter more of these emerging infectious diseases? What in your mind from a research, research perspective has become very important? Sure. So I would like to highlight three categories that I think are really critical places where technology can be applied. The first is around platform trials, which are so critical for creating much more sense out of the vast number of compounds that are under development right now. And that's a space that integrates model-informed drug development principles, clinical trial simulations, um, technological innovations like clinical operations software that can match patients with sites in an epidemic that's shifting its geography, and tools for remote mo monitoring, particularly when you're studying outpatients and you need to be able to collect data. Uh, a second really critical area is around repurposing old compounds, and that includes integrating real-world data, building and using repurposing libraries, and doing in silico experiments to help direct the use of those compounds. And then last, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention this from the Gates perspective, our technologies for scalability and global equity. We really need to be thinking from the beginning about how to solve this problem for the globe, and that includes thinking about vaccine platforms that can be scaled and produced cheaply, diagnostics that can be used with minimal, minimal equipment in, in places that don't have a lot of infrastructure, and really simple cell phone apps that can collect data in places with low infrastructure but where cell phone use is high. And Stefan, I wanted to ask you about the vaccine that you're developing um, at Moderna. It is using a relatively new technology and it's, it's being used for the first time in an emergency public health setting. Can you describe the rationale behind your approach? Yes, yeah, so good morning and thank you for having me. So we use messenger RNA technology in our product, where basically we in our factory make a synthetic messenger RNA coding, in this case for one protein of a virus, the spike S protein, 
we inject it intramuscular like a regular vaccine. And what happens is the mRNA that we inject in humans translate the spikeless protein, which is presented to the immune system and not an immune response. So the amazing thing about mRNA, of course, is the speed. We were able to go from the sequence of a virus available online around January 11 to starting a phase one study on March 16. Uh, this was possible because we had done nine vaccines in the clinic before. So this was not, if you want, our first vaccine in clinical trial. We had those more than a thousand humans, which allowed us to work very closely with the FDA to do a non-GLP tox study. So we did a toxicology study in animal before, of course, those in human, but not per the usual GLP standard, which takes many, many months. We did it in our labs and we did it at the NIH and the Tony Fauci uh, team. Uh, so, so, so that's a, a new technology that enabled the speed. I mean, we announced last week we uh, uh, got the green light from the FDA to start a phase two study. So, if you think about it, we started four months ago, and we're going to start a phase two now, which is kind of really uh, remarkable. And we announced also uh, last week that we should be able to start the phase three, the big, you know, tens of thousands of people clinical study in early summer of this year. On the manufacturing front, because scalability is critical, uh, we announced a partnership with Lanza. We believe we should be able, assuming a 50 microgram dose, which we believe should be a dose that's working, we should know very, very soon now, uh, will get us up to a billion dose per year. And all of this, the scaling up and even um, the time scale for developing the vaccine has been very, very telescoped. I, you know, I think it's unprecedented. And we've heard from Dr. Fauci too, that it's just unheard of how quickly we've moved from, as you just described, the genetic sequence to having something that, um, you know, in a vial that, that could potentially be tested. Can you just very briefly talk to us a little bit about that and what that means to, to really shorten that time scale and what what has that meant for the manufacturing process the ability to get things um, scaled up to, you know the supplies everything ready it, you know if the trials do show that it's effective um, to immediately scale up what has that meant for um, moderna in terms of being able to be prepared that quickly to have something both first in testing and then potentially available for wide scale use around the world yes i think it goes back to the science which is Messenger RNA, at the end of the day, is an information molecule. You know, it's made of four letters. It's the same technology we use for a flu vaccine, and we've done two in the clinic, or a Zika vaccine, or a CMV vaccine, or pick your favorite virus. It's the same recipe every time over, which is really the power of a platform. You have an incredible network effect, because all the work we've done over the last nine years could be deployed right away in this pandemic setting, which is where we were able to go so fast. Uh, Dr. Fauci has said publicly that for SARS, it took 20 months to go from sequence of a virus to starting the first phase one. And here it took two months, it took 63 days. Uh, and actually, I think next time over, we could actually go even faster because it was the first time we were going so fast. And as we know, it is very rare that Homo sapiens does their best work the first time they try something. Um, and so on the clinical side, I think this really rested on the investments we made over the years, the nine clinical studies we have done in vaccines. Uh, on the manufacturing front, it's a big acceleration for us because we're only planning to be commercial uh, two to three years from now. That was the pre-COVID plan. And so the good news is because we do a you know, five-year plan every year and our manufacturing leadership of Juan Andres used to run manufacturing from Novartis worldwide. So he's used to scale, you know, 30,000 people used to work for him. And so we had set up a plan last summer for how would we launch and scale our manufacturing process for the cytomegalovirus vaccine. And so we basically have been using our own capital. Uh, one of the good news is Moderna is well capitalized. So we've basically used our own money at risk over the last few months just to invest uh, incredibly to be able to scale up manufacturing process, to be able to order equipment. Uh, we've not had yet any help from any governments or foundations or others to do that because I think it's too risky at this stage. Uh, we got a grant from the US government to pay the clinical studies. So BARDA uh, granted us $483 million, which is wonderful, to pay the entire clinical program up to approval. So that allows us to invest our own capital on um, manufacturing process scale up and manufacturing capacity. 
because again, Moderna was not ready to make a billion dollars three months ago. Uh, there's a lot of investment in raw materials and capital that needs to happen. And so we have contacted many governments for help. We've contacted many foundations for help. But as of today, unfortunately, we've got no financial support in terms of manufacturing scale up. People think it's still too risky. I want to go back now to the uh, to the clinical side and um, the way that we have been able to uh, sort of track, I guess, and, and monitor patients. Um, Rochelle, I wanted to ask you about some of the ways that technology can be used to perhaps better um, keep track of patients and even detect those who might be at higher risk of developing symptoms so that, you know, for a contagious disease like this, we're able to advise them about um, self-isolation as early as possible. Can you talk a little bit about some of the ways that, you know, it, we can do remarkable things with our cell phones. How much of that ability to um, monitor people, to uh, keep track of um, basic vital signs is, is being useful in the fight against COVID-19? Right, it's a terrific question. So um, a couple things. One is from a public health standpoint, there's been this um, increased, increased use of technology akin to thermometer. So we can actually give people the thermometer. They're using it every day to, to self-monitor and take their own temperatures. If that information goes to a central database, we can sort of see the average population temperature. By doing so, we might be able to see places where their average population temperature is going up even by just a bit to understand and, and um, anticipate when an outbreak might occur. On an individual, level, we can um, see patients in our clinic. We, can, we might be know that they have COVID. We will have diagnosed them. We can send them home with a pulse oximeter. We could potentially use that pulse oximeter to use and monitor their, their disease progress and see um, from central data as to how they are doing without necessarily um, contacting them every day, but maybe every other day following their pulse ox from afar and making sure that their oxygenation is okay. From an AI perspective, you know, I do think that our cell phones could be invaluable tools in terms of contact tracing. Our cell phones know where we have been. Um, they know who we've been in contact with. They know how long we've been in contact with them. And, um, you know, the, there have been data to suggest that contact tracing, diagnosis and contact tracing has to occur within 24 to 48 hours of contact for us to really make a dent in this epidemic. And if that's going to be the case, then the best, the fastest way to do that is to rely on our cell phones phones to say, you actually were in touch and contact with this person in this venue, in CVS. You didn't even know you passed them that long, but you were waiting in a line for them with them for less than six feet apart for five or 10 minutes. And that would be a really valuable way for us to quickly contact people. And of course, um, that seems like the ideal way to do something from a public health perspective. Um, it raises a lot of questions and concerns in the public's mind about privacy. I know that we've we've seen in South Korea, we've always looked to South Korea as um, a potential model for how they were able to control the infection relatively quickly and with relatively few um, draconian measures like uh, lockdowns. However, um, in, in even having uh, anecdotal conversations with people I know there, um, I know that their public is more comfortable with a higher level of what we would call invasion of privacy in terms of geo-tracking and all of that on their smartphones than we are here in the United States. Um, what concerns have you heard about issues of privacy related to that? And in your view, do those concerns, what happens when they butt against um, a, a more sort of global and societal uh, pressure such as controlling a, a public health pandemic? Right, it's a great question. You know, in my mind, I feel like we're operating um, with a series of constraints. There are the medical con and public health constraints. There are the economic constraints. There are the privacy constraints. And sort of, we have to operate within these constraints. And I know people very much want to op open the economy, as do I. But the virus isn't going away. And so we have to be flexible in some of these constraints, in my mind. People are worried about the privacy. And um, when I suggest um, if we were going to open X venue, then would you be amenable? These are a venue public people come. It's not just a work off, uh, an office where we know peop who, people who are coming and going. But, um, movie theater or, an, or a um, museum, would you be comfortable having people as a, as a ticket to entry be willing to say that they were there um, and would people come? And I think um, within the constraints that we're operating, um, you know, the 
anxiety about reopening the economy, I think there has to be a little bit of give on the privacy, but uh, the, the people are worried and, and it's, it's foreign to us. I think that's an issue that we are going to be grappling with, you know, as we see more and more states start to reopen in the coming weeks. Um, David, I wanted to come to you and ask you from a research perspective, if we look sort of historically at our responses to um, epidemics and pandemics, in your view, are we doing a good job of applying whatever new technologies have emerged, you know, in the time between these outbreaks um, to improve our response? And could you give us an example uh, in our COVID-19 response for how technology has made a difference? Sure. I think that there are some things that we're doing incredibly well and we're breaking new ground now, but the complexity comes in the coordination. Um, many of the examples that people have, have cited here require bringing together so many different technical and operational pieces in an unprecedented time frame to make a difference. And if we haven't planned to do that, it's very, very difficult to coordinate. So an example of a tool set that I think is making a huge difference is our systems level biology tools. We have single cell RNA-seq data from humans who are infected, from individuals in different age groups. We have mapping of the viral interactome. And these have happened in, in often in multidisciplinary settings that have brought together scientists from around the world. We're learning, we're rapidly moving from screening in viral cells to screening in human uh, primary cells and in organoids. And we're reverse validating our preclinical models with this clinical data so we can understand their predictability faster. So this is incredible. And I think the excitement about this is that not only are we learning about the biology of COVID, but there are so many factors that influence outcome, comorbidities, age, and we're really going to be learning about the, um, the components of those diseases that impact inflammation and immunity and may even underlie those diseases to some extent, right? Um, and so I think that there's gonna be a huge amount of learning that's relevant, not just to COVID, but to pan viral efforts and to understanding the diseases and conditions like aging that intersect with COVID, just from the basis of generating all the data that we have here. Um, but, but again, um, when you talk about um, the challenges that we have, for example, in doing clinical experimentation, we have hundreds to thousands of trials right now of new compounds and only a very few rigorously designed platform trials or even really highly controlled, well-designed trials in general that use compounds that are informed by model-informed drug development and actually allow us to answer questions with any rigor. And so we have a big false discovery effort as a result of all of that experimentation that's going on in an uncontrolled manner. So I think one of the things we need to do in terms of preparedness for the next time around is really think about how to have those tools ready for deployment earlier in the epidemic um, and that's a difficult challenge because you have to maintain readiness. And so what infrastructure can you maintain between pandemics and what infrastructure do you have to accelerate once the pandemic hits? I think those are all critical points. And Paul, I'd love to get your perspective as a clinician on some of the points that David raised there about um, the need for data and particularly uh, during an ongoing pandemic in an emergency setting how do those needs uh, fall you know, against each other? I know that they, they bang up against each other, the need to take, uh, take care of the patient who's, who's in a critical um, situation in an emergency setting, um, and yet also understand that um, there is a need to understand what is going on with that patient and all of the others coming into an emergency room. Can you talk a little bit about those um, conflicting pressures and, and how you find the balance um, between having gathering the information needed to understand this so that you know a few weeks, few months from now, we can sort of look back and say, um, here's what we learned from it and the immediate needs of taking care of the patient when there are no treatments and there, there is no vaccine yet. Yeah, absolutely. I think there really are, are both micro and macro uh, level considerations with that question uh, on the micro, on the individual patient level. Uh, we, we have seen unprecedented information sharing about uh, the problems of COVID, about treatment difficulties, about potential therapies. Uh, but a lot of this has still been practicing by anecdote that we hear that patients make clots in certain ways or need may need anticoagulation, may need changes to their ventilator regimen. And there's been a temptation, I think, for a lot of people to, uh, to 
fall off of what have been the time proven uh, methodologies of science to make sure we get enough data uh, that should guide our decision making. And I think uh, by pooling our data, by creating larger scale research networks that are, operate much faster than some of our, our old school research, I think we'll be able to make much better data driven decisions rather than anecdote decisions uh, based, on, uh, based on the science that we have. But at the macro level really is, is where I think we, we have the most that we need to be doing right now. Uh, we, we have a lot of natural level experiments going on with different communities, different states, different parts of the globe, uh, opening up uh, the, their societies in different ways. And what we know is, is that it's actually the patient presentation data, the emergency department visits, the clinic visits, the hospitalizations, the ICU visits, that tell us whether or not the pace is too fast or whether interventions are working or not. But, but right now, we, we don't gather all that data from all those different sources in an aggregate way and link it to the decisions that are being made. And so Rochelle mentioned AI or, or machine learning. We really need to be feeding that data in because ultimately there's about a one to two week lag between presentation of illness and the decisions uh, that have been made about societal opening. Uh, it's a little bit like driving your, your uh, car on the highway and you push the gas pedal, but nothing's going to happen for 20 seconds. If we don't have uh, machine learning to help us figure out what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and when we need to change course, uh, we're not going to be making good decisions based on individual level data at individual hospitals or even sometimes individual cities. Right. And now I wanted to um, pose to you all, all of you a question that uh, came in from our audience about um, what does the new normal look like? I think we've touched on it from each of you a little bit, but I'd love to run down the, the line here and, and get your view of what we what it'll look like when um, the country does reopen, because I think we all understand and appreciate that it won't be business as usual. Um, Rochelle, let's start with you. All right, uh, you know, um, some of this is not technology. Some of this new normal is really the blunt tools that we have for, for mitigation strategies. I think all of our tomorrows until we have a vaccine will be in masks. Um, I think we will be further apart. I think we will be doing more telehealth, which has been an extraordinary success, I would say, of this pandemic. I think we will be doing more um, working from home. People have demonstrated that that has worked. And then I think we will be leveraging the technology, as has been discussed for the last um, hour, um, to figure out how we can do some more monitoring and tracking. Um, I, I would love to see more tests going on. I would love to see them out of the medical center, medical centers. Um, but I do think, and I think everybody's going to be attesting that they're asymptomatic before they show up to any venue um, for the near future. I just want to really quick before we move on, um, what does it mean to take the testing out of the medical centers? What are you envisioning that people will be able to do this at home and right now we all need a doctor's order in order to even um, qualify for a test. You're envisioning people will be able to do this sort of like they keep track of, um, of uh, their blood sugar levels? I would love to see that. I would say even at a pharmacy or even at their workplace um, would be wonderful. Right now, it requires an N95. It requires a doctor order. It requires um, a negative pressure space. It uh, requires a nurse to call and return the result. All of those, in, in addition to the, the technology, in addition to the lab tests and, and expense itself and the NP swabs and all the things that have been in limited supply, um, there have been many um, personnel resources and physical resources that have made it really difficult to, to um, expand testing capacity. Great. Paul? I, I think we're going to be having to figure out uh, solutions to some of the challenges that are absolutely unavoidable. Uh, we know that congregate living situations, whether it's senior care situations, prisons, even colleges where people are, are together and really uh, in most ways are going to have to be uh, together physically near one another uh, for the foreseeable future. We're going to have to figure out how to, to, to deliver care and how to operate those environments safely. I think we're also going to have to deal with the unavoidable challenges that will come from other threats that will happen during the time of COVID. And so there are going to be tornadoes this summer. There always are. There are going to be hurricanes. And those always force people into shelters, force people into situations where they're going to have to be near one another. So we're going to have to figure out these new rules uh, that apply when we can't avoid having people in congregate settings, but we're going to have to figure out how to do it safely. And David. So I just want to point out that the, vex the, the, the epidemic is really highlighting issues of inequity and inequality. We're seeing, aside from nursing homes, at the highest site settings for transmission and disease are in poor communities. 
we're going to have huge issues around equity of global access once we have an effective vaccine. And so how we respond to these issues, I think, is going to really define the COVID era. And Stefan. Yes, I think the biggest impact is going to be on just how we live together and how we work. I mean, if you think about the company as one example, we are planning to keep everybody who can work from home to stay working from home to reduce density for our colleagues that have to be in the labs, to be in the factory. I think it's going to be a big change. I, I'm hoping that some of the treatments will help reduce the fatality rate, which I feel will change a lot how people are already scared today. It's going to have a massive impact on travel, how we work. You know, we've realized, I think, through this period that we can do actually much more on Zoom than we thought we could before. Uh, so I, I think it's going to be a big change in the workplace, just how we work together. All right. Thank you all. Thank you, Stefan, Paul, David, and Rochelle for your perspective on how we can and really should continue this conversation around making sure that technology continues to be an important part of improving how we respond, how we respond to infectious disease outbreaks.